Good evening and welcome to Primetime Lawmakers for March 16th, 2011, the 30th Legislative Day of the 2011 session of the Georgia General Assembly. On this crossover day, when a bill must pass its chamber of origin by the end of the day to be eligible to cross over to the other chamber, both chambers continue to be in session as dozens of bills are considered. I'm Scott Slade. Coming up in tonight's program, despite cries that the legislation was dead this session, the Senate passes a Sunday alcohol sales bill. A bill removing the ban on carrying firearms in churches passes the Senate. A bill raising the cap on private school scholarship programs clears the House. We continue our leadership interview series tonight. Georgia Supreme Court Justice Carol Hunstein talks about judicial reform. And on this crossover day, we'll be talking about the effect of legislation on small business and consumers. I'll be joined on set by Danny Oreck, Deputy Director of Georgia Watch, a consumer advocacy group, and Kyle Jackson, the State Director of the National Federation of Independent Businesses, a small business association. All that is coming up tonight on Primetime Lawmakers. But first, supporters of Sunday Alcohol hall sales are one step closer to bringing the matter to the voters. And Wandy Lawson joins us live from the Capitol with more on Senate passage of SB 10. And Wandy, about a month ago, Senate leadership declared this bill dead. How did it wind up on the calendar today? Well, Scott, you know the bill was voted out of Senate rules yesterday. Now, many senators on the floor today talked about the behind-the-scenes lobbying that's been taking place ever since the session began. Some claim that their future in state government was threatened if they voted against SB 10. Closing debate today, however, Senator John Bullock told his colleagues to vote their consciences on the measure that would allow local governments to ask voters whether retailers should sell alcohol in their, on, in their areas on Sundays. This legislation is really no different than the legislation that we passed back in, I think it was 94, that allowed for local communities to vote if they wanted to allow alcohol by the drink to be sold in a food establishment. Five attempts were made to amend the bill to change the hours alcohol could be sold and when the public could vote on the issue. Senators Barry Loudermilk and David Schaefer wanted to offer voters the chance to reconsider Sunday sales at bars and restaurants and to vote down Sunday sales in the future. It may have been put on the ballot years ago to allow for by the drink sales. That's never been put back on the ballot again. So if a value system of a community changes over time, those who may wish that there was no alcohol sales have not had an ability to have their voice to be heard. There's a provision in the code for them to have a referendum to cancel sales from Monday through Saturday, but the original bill four years ago didn't allow the cancellation of Sunday sales once it had been approved. And so we fixed those problems with that bill. For reasons that are unclear to me, the bill that was introduced at the beginning of those sessions has those same problems. These amendments were put in for one purpose, to get the bill. Two top Senate Republicans don't see eye to eye on the measure with Senate Majority Leader Chip Rogers favoring SB 10 in opposition to Senate President Pro Tem Tommy Williams. I'm a no vote on the bill. I think it, I think we have to vote on it. I think the author deserves a vote, but I'll, I'll say this. Be careful when you change the law. Likewise, Democratic Majority Leader Robert Brown opposed the bill in contrast to Democratic Caucus Chair Doug Stoner. So if this issue is about honoring the Sabbath, then we need to go ahead and make the whole weekend holy at that point. Let's not have sales on Friday or Saturdays. So again, to me, this is just a very straightforward vote. This is a vote to allow your local officials to make this decision as has been the tradition when it comes to this particular subject matter. But Atlanta Democrat Senator Vincent Ford sees things differently. I'm a good capitalist. I don't begrudge anybody's making a profit. But making a profit at the expense of our communities is something I have a concern about. I've talked about the proliferation of alcohol stores in my district. But it's not just my district. There are many districts that you represent where liquor stores and beer and wine stores are located indiscriminately. Successful attempt to postpone action on the bill. SB 10 went on to pass the Senate by a vote of 32 to 22. It now moves to the House. The Senate also votes today to expand gun carry rights to include concealed weapons in churches, unless the congregation bans this practice. Senator Jeff Mullis says churches should not have been excluded from the gun carry legislation passed last year. This is all in keeping with the terrible incidents that's happened in Texas and California where in a large congregation they open the door and start shooting and there's no one there to defend themselves. And uh, mass murder happened there 
And that struck uh, a nerve with a lot of churches, and my churches in particular have testified to these committees over the past couple of years and had wanted the opportunity for them, if they choose, to allow weapons on their premises. Will, will the senator further I you? certainly will. Isn't it true that most churches uh, who, that are large churches that, that have uh, a lot of money that comes in, have a, a police officer or security guard that they hire to, to be there or they use their deacons and they train them. Is that not true? Senator, you're talking right up uh, the issue I'm uh, trying to express. Large churches have the ab ability to afford a security force and small churches do not and uh, assign some of their deacons on security and that but is what they're asking for basically. <laughs> SB 102 was amended to expand the number of gun owners who are exempted from being licensed and allowing permitted gun owners to bring their weapons into government buildings. The measure passed by a vote of 41 to 11. It moves to the House. The Senate also agreed to maintain a DNA database of those arrested for felonies, even if they're not convicted. Opponents of SB 80 argued that it would be difficult for those found not guilty to remove their DNA from the system. Bill sponsor Senator Joshua McCoon said that this was a minor consideration when balanced against the increased crime-solving capability. He was questioned about the cost of the DNA bank. The act will only become effective upon specific appropriation of funds. We're all very aware of the financial situation the Georgia Bureau of Investigation is in and uh, the load that they're already dealing with. We certainly hope upon passage of Senate Bill 80 and that it's effective into law uh, that there will be a move to appropriate the funds necessary to implement it. There are about 135,000 felony arrests every year. I cannot speak to the senator's question as to how many of those uh, that are arrested uh, are not ultimately convicted. SB 80 was amended to allow DNA samples to be destroyed if the charges are dismissed. That measure passed the Senate by a vote of 39 to 13. It now goes to the House. The House agreed to create the Special Council on Justice Reform for Georgians. That's the first step in the governor's proposal to overhaul the state's criminal justice system. The vote on HB 265 was 169 to 1. That bill now moves to the Senate. And both the House and the Senate also adopted measures changing how juries are selected. Proponents of SB 191 and HB 415 say the forced balancing method in which court clerks study jury pools based on each county's demographics should be replaced by a computerized selection process. Both measures pass their respective chambers and then will be sent to the other bodies. Although the House and Senate both considered expansions to school voucher programs, only the House was able to pass its version. Those who support House Bill 325 say an increase on the cap for the scholarship program that allows students to attend private schools is warranted because the program actually saves public schools money. But House Democrats disagree. They've been working to dismantle the program. Many of us believe that what we passed in the underlying code is essentially a backdoor attempt uh, to fund private school tuition using public dollars. HB 325 passed by a vote of 171 to 1. It moves to the Senate, where Senate Majority Leader Chip Rogers' attempt to expand the state's special needs voucher program was stalled today for lack of support. I mean, to say, well, listen. My school superintendent called me and, look, my schools are great. Really? I'll say this, and this is my answer to every one of the school superintendents that makes that phone call. If your schools are so great, you've got nothing to fear because no one will leave. Educational freedom is about children. It's not about schools. It's not about systems. And the reason we're there and the reason we're 46th, 47th, 48th, whatever you want to say, is because too many adults fight each other about education and forget about the kids. Senator Rogers said he could not get 32 senators to support SB 87, so he asked for the bill to be tabled, effectively killing it for this session. In other education news, the Senate approved a measure to allow the graduates of districts that lose accreditation to qualify for the HOPE scholarship. Senator Donzella James led the passage of SB 119, which also allows students at unaccredited colleges to maintain the lottery-funded scholarship. SB 119 passed the Senate by a vote of 47 to 6. It now moves over to the House. 
And yesterday, Governor Nathan Deal signed HB 326, the Hope Scholarship Revision, into law. That program, of course, offers students with GPAs over 3.3 the opportunity to have a portion of their tuition paid, and those with a grade point average of 3.7 and SAT scores of at least $1,200, excuse me, of at least $1,200 to earn a full ride to a state school. Now on Monday, state NAACP leaders were at the Capitol urging the governor to veto his legislation and calling for a boycott of the state lottery and a recall vote for legislators who supported the legislation, among them House Minority Leader Representative Stacey Abrams. Absolutely, there are students who will not have what they had this year. There are students who will have more than they thought they would be able to have, and there are families that are going to have to make difficult decisions. As a Democrat and as the leader of the Democrats in the House, it is my obligation to serve all of those populations. I don't have the luxury of picking and choosing winners and losers. My job is to work as hard as possible to get as many winners to the table as possible. A decision not to fund the lottery is a personal decision, but the understanding has to be that there are consequences for that. I think an, an alternative approach is to push for more funding, for better funding, for more opportunities for money to go into the HOPE scholarships so we're not facing these conversations every year. The House and Senate, of course, still in action at this hour. Discussion about HB 461 just concluded. That's the Health Care Compact Act. Uh, opponents of that measure say that it was an attempt to disrespect the federal government's action on uh, health care. The measure did pass the House, though, by a vote of 108 to 63, moving it over to the Senate. Senate, meanwhile, is debating SB 210 that would allow lawsuits against abortion doctors. And just over 90 minutes ago, the House agreed to continue the Delta Air Airlines jet fuel tax exemption through the next fiscal year. This drew opposition from the Clayton County delegation, whose members say Delta takes this tax break for granted and never consulted them about the legislation. HB 322 passed the House by a vote of 113 to 61. It now moves over to the Senate. Reporting live from the Capitol, I'm in Wandy Lawson for Primetime Lawmakers. So, Wandy, I'm hearing the voting bells going off in the background. The work's not done under the Gold Dome yet in this crossover day. What other pieces of legislation are you tracking this evening? Well, of course, I think we're getting ready to get a vote now on uh, SB 210. That's the measure sponsored by Senator Barry Loudermilk, which under certain circumstances would permit women to sue their doctors for abortion. Uh, we also have a number of child welfare measures still towards the bottom of the Senate calendar and even some hunting bills still out there on the calendar, although both the House and Senate are working down towards the backside of their uh, legislative calendars for today. It's been a busy day. Thank you very much, Amandi. Thanks, Scott. A few moments ago, Amandi reported on the passage of Judicial Justice Reform Bill by the House, a sweeping measure to address the prison population and case backlog in Georgia. Now, this measure has the support of all three branches of government. In tonight's leadership segment, I begin my discussion with Georgia Supreme Court Chief Justice Carol Hunstein by asking her about what prompted that legislation. Well, um, my governor, Zell Miller, uh, took a very tough stance on crime, and we have some of the toughest sentences. Uh, penalties for criminal violations in of any state in the United States. Um, because of those sentences, we have uh, the fourth highest incarceration rate in the nation, and we have the highest per capita of uh, defendants who are under some form of corrections, whether it be in prison or on probation or on parole. One in Every 13 citizens in this state is under some form of corrections control. Um, that is more than double what the rate is in other states. Which leads us to talk about judicial reform. Mm -hmm. And is the goal there to lock up fewer people or to uh, uh, lock up fewer nonviolent offenders or what? The goal is to be smart on crime and not just tough on crime. I think what we have realized and other states in the United States have realized that just putting in people in prison does not keep them from reoffending. Uh, the, the recidivism rate, the chance that they're going to reoffend if they go from prison uh, back into society is uh, I believe one in 29. Uh, if, you, if they, they go through uh, one of the treatment courts, whether it's a DUI court or a, a drug addiction court or a mental health court, those defendants, their recidivism rate, the reoffending rate is much lower. Um, for drug courts, it's about 
seven out of uh, following them for two years, you have a seven percent reoffense rate. Where straight from prison, you have a twenty-nine percent mm. reoffense rate. But, but big difference there. Big uh, difference. The bill passed by the House that sets up the ju Judicial uh, mm -hmm. Reform Commission uh, passed with little opposition today. Now this doesn't seem like the, like it's a partisan issue. Are other state leaders uh, eager to address these concerns? I, I think they are. I think this clearly is not um, a partisan issue at all. I think it really is an opportunity for the three branches of government, both the governor, the executive branch, the legislature, and the judicial branch to work together to keep our public safer as well as saving them taxpayer dollars. What will this Judicial Reform Commission do if it's finally approved by the legislature and signed into law? We are going to look at uh, different ways to address the problem with um, those who are drug addicted, alcohol addicted, or who have mental health problems to see if we can't have programs that will address those concerns and really reach the root cause of crime so that they will not reoffend, so that our communities will be safer. Uh, this is a movement that really has gone national, and we will be looking at all the possible ways that we can keep nonviolent offenders out of our prison system and save those prison beds for defendants who are truly violent. One of the things you addressed in your State of the Judiciary message this year was the cost of doing nothing. And with mm -hmm. one out of 13 Georgians under uh, some sort of incarceration, that has to be hugely expensive. Uh, yes, the the incarceration rate, the Department of Corrections budget is over a billion dollars a year. Uh, that is really quite substantial. So it's very, very expensive to incarcerate someone in the prison system. The average cost of, of keeping an inmate in prison is a little over $49. To have someone in a treatment court is a little less than five dollars well, per day. Well, a much better result. Uh, much better result. For recidivism, that's for sure. That's exactly right. Uh, Georgia has a huge court backlog, too. Uh, yes, we do. It, it, and it's been mentioned that changes, the charges against some suspects may have to be dropped mm -hmm. if we can't get to speedy trials. How will all this dovetail together to help that process and get things moving in the courts? Uh, unfortunately, um, there may be instances where those who may be guilty of a crime um, will be released from any kind of prosecution, which means they can never be brought back to trial because the United States Constitution and the Georgia Constitution require that defendants be given a speedy trial. Uh, if that the court determines, both the trial court and then the appellate court, determine that the speedy trial has been violated, they walk free never to be prosecuted again. So part of the problem has been in funding. Uh, the budget, of course, has um, had substantial restrictions lately, and the, and the judicial system has participated in that uh, as much as we possibly could. But because of the reduction in, in court personnel, in particular the loss of uh, senior judges, uh, in the trial courts, it has had a substantial impact, not just on criminal cases, mm -hmm. but on the ability of uh, civil cases to be tried, uh, for domestic relations, divorce cases to be tried, uh, it's, uh, it's very difficult. You have an increasing caseload with a, with a bad economy, and so the courts are straining to do their constitutional duty. And what does that do to the business environment in, in Georgia? Does that make some businesses reluctant to, to come here if we have all these strains on our system? I think the studies have indicated that, indeed, it is a problem for businesses who are currently here and businesses who are thinking of locating here if their court system is not available to resolve their disputes. Madam Chief Justice, it looks like the first step's been taken uh, toward judicial reform by the legislature. Many thanks for your service and, uh, and your thoughts on this. It's great to see you. Well, thank you. It's very nice to be here. After the short break, we'll be talking about the impact of legislation on businesses and consumers. I'll be joined by Danny Oruk of Georgia Watch and Kyle Jackson of the National Federation of Independent Businesses. So stay with us.
Welcome back to Primetime Lawmakers. In this crossover day, bills and resolutions are still whizzing by quicker than a lot of folks can sometimes follow. We thought it would be valuable to stop for a moment. Consider where lots of legislation hits home. Consumers and especially small businesses as well. From tax and health care reform to ethics and home foreclosure laws, the General Assembly has dozens of bills before it that directly affect you or your workplace. To get those perspectives, I'm joined now live in studio by Danny Oreck. He's Deputy Director of Georgia Watch, a consumer advocacy group. And Kyle Jackson, the state director of the National Federation of Independent Businesses, a small business association. Thanks to both of you for joining us this evening on what's a huge day of the Georgia General Assembly and change is, is in the air. And one of those things they're talking about, at least, is, is tax reform. The recommendations of the Tax Reform Council that are leaning a little heavier on uh, consumption taxes, a little less heavy on, uh, on, on personal income taxes. And, and Danny, from the consumer's point of view, well, how do you folks feel about that? Well, George Watch hadn't taken a position on tax reform itself. Um, certainly consumers want a simple tax code, uh, one that's easy to, to predict um, and, and makes sense for everybody. Kyle, as far as small businesses are concerned, it might weigh a little heavier on them. More businesses might have to wind up collecting sales taxes. Sure, absolutely. And I, I would echo Danny's points. Our, our members are looking for simplicity, consistency, uh, predictability. You know, uh, the, the income tax is a big uh, issue for small businesses because many, if not all, pay their business taxes at the inc personal income level. So I was excited to see that uh, as part of the recommendations and hoping whatever the final product is will include an income tax cut. Both the national and state levels, there's a lot of talk about health insurance. Senator Tim Golden sponsoring a measure to establish an advisory commission on mandated health insurance benefits. And, and also Matt Ramsey, Representative Ramsey, sponsoring a bill that allowed Georgia consumers to buy health insurance policies across state line that really aren't regulated by the state insurance commissioner. Let's start with you on that. Good or bad? Well, I think 17 is a very manageable approach because Tim Golden's uh, bill basically allows for there to be discussion about individual mandates. Let's take each individual mandate, do a cost-benefit analysis, and decide whether that works for Georgia. Those existing in law as well as those that might be proposed in the future. The problem with House Bill 47 it's not really about consumers choosing their insurance plan. It's really about insurance companies choosing what state laws that they want to be regulated under, as opposed to just being regulated by the laws that have been enacted by our elected officials. So, that, so allowing more products to come across the line would not increase competition and lower prices? It'd be a race to the bottom. And what it would wind up doing for those people who remain in small pools here in Georgia, it's going to make their costs go up because it incentivizes healthy people to leave those plans and go to states which have very lax consumer protections and thereby the sickest Georgians have to pay even more for their health care. Kyle, small, small employers, how do they feel about these health yeah, issues? Yeah, uh, I guess we agree on Senate Bill 17. I think it's a, it's a good piece of legislation. I also uh, want to talk about House Bill 47. It's, I think it's a very important piece of legislation and a very pro-consumer piece of legislation. You know, small business owners are consumers themselves. Uh, and the number one issue of concern for my members dating back to 1986 has been the lack of affordable health insurance. And I think this bill uh, is a creative way to increase competition, to increase access, and ultimately lower health insurance costs for, for the self-employed. From both your points of view, there's a lot of mystery left in the whole health care process, you know, whether court suits are, are settled, what track George is going to take. Right now, there seems to be a two-track approach underneath the Gold Dome, isn't there? Yeah, uh, legislators are struggling with, uh, I guess, the, the, the choice of whether we hope that, that health care is completely thrown out or whether we go along for now and do what we can to make sure that the state of Georgia is prepared to serve its uh, citizens best, whether or not uh, the federal legislation is upheld in, in court. But small employers uh, enjoy more state controlled or more federal controlled? Uh, definitely state controlled and we're in a, unique, in a unique situation because we're actually party to the federal lawsuit against federal health care reform. Uh, but that being said, I think Georgia is better served by being proactive uh, and making sure that we set up things that are uh, pro-business and pro-consumer uh, versus relying on whatever the federal government may come up with. Illegal immigration is a hot button issue and obviously that has some effect on, on business. And, and Kyle, I'll start with you on this. Um, the effect of, for instance, using E-Verify. Sure. Is it too burdensome of small business? Sure. Well, you, when you talk about the smallest of businesses, I think that's a real concern. Uh, you know, uh, immigration is, is something that our lawmakers have identified as a problem. Uh, it, we would be best served by a federal solution. I think everybody agrees to that. Uh, but if the state chooses to go forward with either piece of legislation, I'd like to see some more thought given to protecting the smallest of employers from uh, unnecessary burdens in the hiring process. So maybe raising the number of, uh, of employees that I think that would exempt? be exempt. That would be a very appropriate thing. 
Uh, about Georgia Watch on that? Georgia Watch doesn't have a position on the illegal immigration debate, but I can tell you it is uh, causing a lot of bloodletting at the state capitol. I bet you have a position on uh, ethics. Uh, sure, yeah, sure. As far as uh, allowing political contributions, particularly by utility companies. Why on that? Um, it's a very problematic uh, story is being, or, or rather conversations being had in public affairs uh, circles and at the state capitol that in light of the Citizens United case that Georgia needs to comply with the First Amendment, and that is a complete ruse. What this bill is about, it would allow utilities in Georgia, which are currently not allowed to get involved in political campaigns, to donate directly to those campaigns and to set up PACs for their, employer, their employees and their contractors to donate to campaigns. Um, the, the Atlanta Journal-Constitution uh, looked into this issue and found that over in Alabama, Alabama Power, which is a subsidiary of Southern Company, dumped almost $1 million into campaigns. And that you can do a lot with a million dollars here in Georgia. Now, what about individual ethics reform as far as lobbying is concerned? Uh, unfortunately, uh, that didn't go anywhere this year. Um, there's been a bill that, that was introduced in the Senate, uh, but it did not uh, get through committee for a hearing. There is going to be a lot of study about this issue later on in 2011. Senator Josh mm -hmm. McCoon wants to really study this, and he is uh, going to be allowed to chair a study committee. Any thoughts for small business on all that? Or? Yeah, I think you know transparency is important, uh, whether it be in political contributions or in the, the case of ethics reform. You know, we've got transparency now. I think the system in many ways works. Uh, in concerned citizens, individuals can see who's giving what to uh, elected officials, whether it's in political contributions or in the forms of other things. Uh, and I, I think that I don't think we need to really throw out the system wholesale. I think we can maybe tinker around the edges, but what we have today, uh, I think works pretty well. Bill's dealing with bank foreclosures have, you know, certainly among the industry have gotten attention, but they really haven't hit the buzz level right as far as the populace is concerned. Uh, speak a little of this uh, as far as consumers needing greater protection from bank foreclosures. What's happening there? Well, I, certain, I certainly think it's an issue that's uh, very, that's very much playing into the lives of consumers. You know, a lot of people, unfortunately, because of the economy, have perhaps lost their job and aren't able to make payments uh, and are faced with the possibility of losing their home. Or perhaps you have neighbor, neighbors uh, who are in that position and you're left with vacant houses in your neighborhood. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's, it's an issue that affects us all. There's a bill that's sitting in the House Rules uh, Committee as we speak tonight, and it may get put onto the floor uh, that would extend the notice time for consumers from 30 to 90 days if there is going to be a foreclosure. And it would state in law that the consumers can cure the default simply by making all the back payments and any late fees, as opposed to having to pay the entire balance of the loan, which is impossible for almost anybody unless they win the lottery. Any thoughts on that from your... You group? know, it's an issue that we've really not engaged in, um, and okay. so not really my thing. Yeah, the, the banks, you know, probably... I hate to put words in their mouth, might like that. They'll own fewer properties and will they'll get more good loans maybe out of this. Yeah, right now, uh, this, I think, would not have any major effect on the operations of most lenders mm -hmm. because if you're, if you're in the position of a lender that's foreclosing left and right and having loans failing, if you can get a loan to perform, you know, even at perhaps 95% rather than 100%, that we'll would be... to leave it there. Thank you very much. Appreciate you both being here. out of time. Prime time lawmakers will be seen tomorrow will not be seen tomorrow or Friday because the General Assembly will not be in session. And after today, uh, we'll be thankful for the rest, too. It's been quite a day. Primetime Lawmakers returns Monday, March 21st at 7 p.m. on GPB. See a repeat of this broadcast tomorrow morning at 5.30 right here. Coming up next, travel tips from the expert Rick Steves, Europe with Abandon. So stay tuned. That's our broadcast for this 30th Legislative Day of the 2011 session. Thanks to our guests for joining us. For Wandy Lawson of the Primetime Lawmakers team, I'm Scott Slade. See you Monday at 7. Have a great night. Area of the code. Uh, of this bill that would really mess with other sections of the code. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, amendment number two is authored by the Senate from 36, recognized as a speaker to our amendment. This is a GPB original production.